He's an interesting character for us. We've done Spider-Man, we've done X-Men, we've done superpowers. Many of the Marvel properties have long histories in Hollywood. Iron Man was at least at Fox and New Line before coming back to us. And for whatever reason, you know, the time wasn't right. It's been a different journey for Marvel since it's really their first real venture coming out as a company, fully financing and releasing Iron Man. And it's a big deal to be a part of this production. So much of the company is now invested into this potential franchise, which is really what these films are meant to be. But we need a storyteller. John is a talent in many fields, from the camera, behind the camera. But when you look at Maid and Elf and Zathura, that's a track of a filmmaker that is nearing the top of his game. But very important for us with him is his love for Iron Man. That was the movie he wanted to make. Iron Man is one of the comics where you have very few purists who have attached themselves to specific storylines. In the case of Iron Man, it's the myth of Iron Man. It's the suit. It's what the suit could do. Things change from time to time with the suit, but there's a basic character that Tony Stark has and a certain look that the suit has. I went in to meet them and, and then wound up screen testing for Tony Stark for Iron Man. I was like, I went in the building and everywhere you go, there's another movie you love and the Spider-Mans and everything. And I go, it gotta be really great if I could do one of these. It was kind of like an independent director and cast, but you know, doing this this great big film, so it was the best of both worlds. Ah! I'm jealous. This is the part of uh, the Marvel offices that they gave us for Iron Man pre-production. Normally, we would, you know, start this, uh, we, would, we would rent some office space near a studio. We're about to move to Playa Vista Studios. Uh, so this is, this allowed us to sort of get a running start and be close to the people who are part of uh, Marvel Studios here. So it was, it was nice, so we had these great digs and we got to use the meeting spaces and we're starting to outgrow this space. Here are some different, um, the evolution of, of concept art for the suit. These are earlier designs that we didn't go with, but they helped evolve the suit into the final look. The suit evolved over decades, and it wasn't until an artist named Adi Granoff took a whack at the costume and reinvented it that you found a suit that looked more like a solid armor, more like something with a military application, almost like a flying machine, and not like a suit that somebody slipped on and was skin tight and happened to be metallic. This suit felt real. It felt like something mechanical, something that was tech-based. And that was the image that I gravitated towards from the whole packet of 40 years of Iron Man images that was given to me. The suit for the movie is completely different. In my artwork, I try to make things appear functional, but they're not functional because there isn't a real person inside. We spent months and months trying to figure out how different sections uh, bend and intersect and uh, how there could be a person inside and if he bends his arm it will it actually break his bones and I mean all those details like that and then the helmet and how the helmet opens and uh, can the head fit inside the helmet and then does the make the head look too big I mean all these things then in a comic book I mean I just draw it whatever looks the best. We have uh, basically the uh, the chest piece which you see on one of the other renderings here, the abdomen piece, which would go on sort of like a tank top. You have uh, the uh, boxer shorts sort of area, and then the leg, and the whole idea is to make uh, each of these components expand so that you can just slip into them as one big piece, and then uh, as you put them on, they would collapse and end up snug on the leg. Here's Ryan working on working on some, some keyframe work from the movie of uh, Tony Stark first waking up in captivity. This is the beginnings of some thoughts for the beginnings of the first gray Iron Man suit. So you can see sort of the chest piece 
And as you can see, these arm pieces were inspired by this piece of hardware here. This armature that we got from Stan Winston was basically a, a starting point to say how, you know, what are the basic pivot points that you would need uh, to be able to move your arms and have as much flexibility as possible. This is also uh, something that we use to help limit the movement that uh, the performer used when we're doing some mocap tests for the CGI on it. This is sort of a, a dogfight sequence that happens late in the second act. As we can see, we're sort of cross-cutting between Rhodey, the pilots, and Tony Stark flying. And these have been color-coded and worked on and photocopied because this is part of what was used to uh, be input into the animatic. This was all input into the computer and animated, and you're able to watch it like you would a movie. I think very early on, John had a very compelling vision for how he wanted to cover the Iron Man action stuff. He wanted to shoot it like we took the Iron Man suit, turn it on, you know, and basically we're flying beside it in a helicopter, and that's how we got Iron Man on camera. The one thing that we still have over previs and animatics is that you can draw a scene really, really quickly, and you can draw changes really, really quickly, and 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 as it should be. I mean, it's an exploratory part of the process to to find find the the vocabulary of the movie and find. The, the angles you want and come up with the coolest stuff possible. If anything, that's the comic book artist. He's sort of like, well, I'm just going to draw, draw, draw. I'm going to make this scene huge, you know? And before you know it, it just it expands into something that's absolutely unmanageable, unshootable. It, it'll, it'll never go in any schedule. But what you can do from that is take the things in it that you respond to. And that's what John did. So this is uh, what I was hoping would be my office, but. They made an appeal to me that this was the biggest room, so we had to, we need a room for all the, uh, the previs crew. So you have uh, animators, CAD artists, everybody who is involved with taking what we did on the storyboards and translating it into uh, a 3D animation. There are certain shots, like this is a really successful shot here. We like this one a lot. His little lights come on, his flying lights. And they're coming into the Santa Monica Pier. Some of these are a little bit too quick. Some of them are a little bit off. The flow is pretty good, but once we refine it in the previs, it will then translate pretty much one for one with the final film. We've seen flying in so many movies, especially through buildings in New York City. We wanted to put this one on the West Coast, where flight sort of began, where we, you know, where you sort of had Hughes' aircraft and sort of keep the tradition of him being a Howard Hughes type character alive. I really like this one, how he's flying over all the buildings. It really feels like you're flying up into space, to the stars. That's really cool. So when we're done with this, it'll actually, uh, hopefully, translate into the actual movie. And we'll be able to watch some finished film while we're working on the movie and show it to the actors and the crew for morale. That's really great. And the camera shake is, is pretty strong. That's really good. See, this is exciting. This like, gives me goosebumps. You're not even fighting a bad guy here. All you're doing is really flying through the air. As I was talking to the people doing the previs, the artists, the storyboard artists, the animatics, it was about how do you really viscerally make you feel as though you're flying? We've all dreamt about flying. How exciting is one of those dreams? It's never boring. I think just the feeling of flying for the first time in a movie like this, if you handle it right, should give you chills. Just seeing him fly, really feeling like you're flying with him, if you cover it the right way, shoot it the right way, and present it to the audience in the right way, it should be an emotional experience. And then when you fight the bad guy, even more fun. But don't blow past that stuff. What's it really like? What would it really be like to get in a suit that could fly? It would be a life-changing experience. Don't lose sight of that, you're making a movie. And movies are about emotion. They're about allowing the audience to experience something they can't in real life but let them experience it in a real way. And that's the hope. The hope is to, to ground this thing in reality wherever we can because it's so superhuman. These heroes are so larger than life that any opportunity we could find to sort of screw it down to reality, we would be hard pressed to, to make a movie without taking advantage of those opportunities that you would really feel something about.
generally speaking, if you're making a movie about a billionaire who can go anywhere and who can do anything and has any amount of money to do anything, and you have a restricted budget, and you have to try and create that world that he lives in, that's a big challenge. He doesn't just have the G5, he has like the 737 private plane. You know, everything is elevated with him. It's not just a house, it's an insane mansion on the bluff in Malibu on a cliff. And so there was a lot of fun in designing, location scouting, casting, shooting. You get to play a little bit of fantasy because when you think you've got something that's enough, you amp it up more. When we were looking for a place to, to film, you know, there were a lot of possibilities. Marvel doesn't have its own lot yet. Maybe someday they will. Uh, and so we're looking for stage space that was large enough and in the Los Angeles area. And one of the places where a lot of films have shot is here at Playa Vista. And we, we thought it was really cool because this was the place that the uh, Spruce Goose was originally built. It was Howard Hughes's old uh, assembly factory and his headquarters for, for some time. You know, it wasn't lost on us that, that the legacy of Howard Hughes was, uh, you know, sort of alive and well here. And, and Tony Stark is, is a little bit of um, the heir to the throne of the uh, Howard Hughes reputation. You know, for so long, the divisions were kept very separate. The film division out in Hollywood, which really was, was producing the films with other studios, was kept very, uh, uh, was separate from the publishing division where they uh, make the comics, was kept separate from the animation division. And it was important to me to bring all those divisions together. So there's multiple chambers, obviously, to this thing for the, uh, for the escape sequence. Marvel Films invited a bunch of us out. You know, myself, Joe Quesada, Axel Alonso, our, our big editor brain trust, and a number of our uh, key creators. It was a great thing even just to go out and be asked and to walk around the, the half-finished sets and see all the pre-production design. And, you know, it really makes you feel, just as a guy working at Marvel, that this really is our movie as opposed to a movie. Is it too much of a shift to ask that he feels that he's fallen short of what his father's ideology is? I think that that's what, that's what we're beginning to imply and we should imply further with yeah. either his alcoholism, his tardiness, his womanizing. Working in the comics for so long and, and sometimes watching the movies and going, ah, oh, that wasn't quite right if they just stayed a little closer to the source material. So part of our being there was saying, guys, how far are we away from the source material? How do we steer it back? Is it okay to steer away this way? And how do we just make this the best possible movie? And I think also for Pepper, she has to realize that the moment that kiss happens, she's the glue in his life. She, you know, without him, every, the whole thing derailed. We had two great uh, writing teams on this film. Art Markham and Matt Holloway came on and did some early drafts for us and continued throughout, uh, throughout the process on and off and uh, Mark Fergus and uh, Hawk Otsby came on board as well. They had worked with John uh, on a film he had developed at another studio that didn't end up moving forward. The Marvel Comics is, has been really um, fantastic about giving us the whole history, teaching us everything we could ever want to know about the characters, and then saying, you know, feel free to explore around those parameters. Yeah, when you see something there, you'll love this. Right there. We made a decision early to go with Stan Winston Studios to design with us the Iron Man suits. That's going to be too kicky. Yeah. yeah. And that's too matty. I like the brush feeling. Yeah, this too. Is kind of a... I'd like to say, gosh, everybody was just clamoring after us to do Iron Man. But the fact of the matter is, is that the minute we heard that Iron Man was being made, uh, we went after it. We're all Iron Man fans. It's like, it was like the perfect thing for the studio. So uh, we went, went after the show. And at just about the time that John Favreau was signed to actually direct it was when we took our first meeting uh, with Marvel. And John was in that meeting. This particular film was a, a little bit more uh, interesting because there was already a design idea or a series of design ideas in place. They had conceptual drawings of Iron Man that fit a certain body proportion and a certain body type. So we had to inherit those and then bring them into our world and make them function. The big challenge was the fact that they hadn't cast anyone to be Iron Man. And here it is, here's the final. And that's what we come to. Here it is. Yeah. That's what we get for the amount we have to spend. The journey you generally go through and the creation of a suit is you sit down with Stan Winston, his design team, our internal team, Favreau, the producers, and everyone starts with drawings and images. And you Photoshop and you get to sort of a 2D drawing 
like a color drawing that you can hang up. That then gets moved to a modeling stage, to a 3D model, so you see a quick time of a model that turns. Then that goes to a clay maker, and then you see the first clay made of it, and it's something tangible now that you can touch and you can spin. And we're convinced that a human head would actually fit in this thing, yeah, right? The ears are right up inside, right up against the... It's exciting. This is when you really get a sense of the movie coming together, when you start to see this. It's a bigger leap in some ways to go from an idea to this than to go from this to the actual movie. And then there's generally a maquette that's made, which is a miniature desktop model of it, and it might be only two feet tall. It's a work in oh, progress, that's but great. it's coming along. That's, it. <laughs> that's great. It's obviously, we don't have the wardrobe when we get with help. And then you wait, and you know the next step is the suit. And it's the full-size, shootable, physical suit that a person's going to get into. I've never made a movie of this size before or of this genre. I've always been a fan, but it's a daunting undertaking. The day I knew everything was going to be okay was the day that Robert Downey Jr. was attached to play Iron Man. That is gorgeous. What Kevin's going to do, and, and they're going to take a cast to your foot so that it's a very low relief strap. Stan Winston's reputation and Shane, the guys on that team, I worked with them before. Every time you go into their shop, you go, oh my god, and they did that, and they did that, and AI, and this, and that. And you see a history of films that I grew up on. Uh, the reason that I'm playing Tony Stark, the reason that I'm involved in Iron Man, the reason that I'm so excited is I'm crazy about movies. That's why I wanted to become an actor. That's why I could cry watching Chud, cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers. I buy into movies. I love it. I see the fly. I don't care if that's Jeff Goldblum going, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm in it. They're transporting. The fly's dying. I mean, I'm a sucker for this stuff. Yeah. The best thing I can tell you about me is ultimately I just don't do anything. Oh, well, I'm sick. I'm out of here. All right. Later. Get a good night. Stan, thanks. Good to see you, Rob. Okay. I'll see you soon. I walk in like a fan because I can, I say it humbly because I really don't do it. I did it when I started. Now I oversee it. Shane oversees it. Everybody over. I just enjoy it. I come in and it's easy for me to say, wow, that's cool, do more of that. You know, make sure my name is on the screen. How many gags are you doing? We're going to do the inclined one Yeah. after this one. But this one right now, you're more upright. We're just gonna do a small blender section. Hey, I don't like my little tummy there. I'm not doing all this core work for nothing. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying Behold the mass. I'm beholding <laughs> the f we could hold off on this part. Uh -oh. <laughs> we are building a prototype while we're going. We've never built an Iron Man suit before. Dude, you're soft. zooming in on my hammer right now, aren't you? He's up on the what hammer. Kind of twisted parlor games going down here. <laughs> and so you're given a launching gun, and then you have to hit the finish mark with the suit done. So it's not like we are ever able to kind of make one and then scrap it and make another one and make improvements and scrap that. and make, We have to actually work it all out and deliver at the time we're supposed to. Faster! Thank you. Right now you're in the Stan Winston mold shop, the finishing shop. What you see behind me is where most of the parts are being modeled and parts are being painted. There's about 450 individual parts that make this suit. This is going to be the Mark II's chest. This is where the RT will go. And it, it's actually spray chrome metal, and it's been brushed. This is actually the process of putting in the rivets based on the, the design. And it's actually, it's not really a polished rivet at all. It's just the illusion of a polished rivet. These are two pieces from the Mark III, and these are from our early test. This enormous calf that has sort of the, the accoutrement of, of like jet engines and, and things. But the foot goes in here, and then these panels had to be designed to slide and move. These are large sections of the Crimson Dynamo that are being made. This is a negative flexible mold, and these are just quickie temporary molds to pull out hard shells. 
What's interesting about what Trevor's painting is that this is a flexible paint for urethane that doesn't crack or buckle. And we have a lot of parts that are actually flexible. And it took a long time to get that to work. And this is Tim Nordella, who's mechanizing the Crimson Dynamo. There's a hatch that opens, revealing the, the sinister man who's inside. Eventually, it'll all be dressed like a very, very tight and down, down below, uh, like the cockpit of a, of a dive vessel. But right now, these are just the outer shells and sort of the escape hatch of this particular thing. Here. When you work with someone like Stan Winston's company, so far, this is, our, this is John and my second film with them. It's still a pretty magical experience when that suit's first rolled out. Hey, 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 hey. Shane likes to put it behind a curtain generally and unveil the curtain in a very dramatic way, and there was Iron Man standing behind. What do we do today? I turn it on. And <laughs> Voila! <laughs> and then you look at it and you touch it, and it's sort of half excitement and half fear because it's very real and generally you're pretty close to production at that point when that suit's shown to you. So hopefully your research was right and the proportions all line up and the textures are good and the colors and all the decisions you made along the way make sense. Once you start to not see the whole guy, the proportions yeah. of him, and I think 235 is a good move here, uh, I, think yeah. that, I think it holds up really well. When John first saw it, he was all smiles. I mean, he was, he was really happy. Once the, the stuntmen had really become accustomed to the suit, when they started out, they were just a little afraid of damaging it. Plates intersecting and chipping off paint and that kind of thing. But by the end of the day, he'd really gotten the full range of motion and had sort of learned to live in the suit. Those dailies at the end of the day were just amazing. I think everyone was just blown away. You have to be strong and you have to be athletic to do this. It's like wearing very heavy uh, football gear. Your endurance level has to be up for it because it's a double-edged sword. We have to make it light enough to move, but we have to make it heavy enough not to just completely, you know, crack apart when somebody puts too much muscle into it. So just do a, do a, you know, like the first guy, you know, outside the door. The Mark I with the flamethrowers and stuff was close to 100 pounds. Without the flamethrowers and the gas and everything on it, it was maybe 60 or 70 pounds. Okay, and the camera. What it feels like you're doing inside the suit doesn't relate at all. When I'm walking, if I look down to see my mark at all, they notice. But when I roll my shoulders up and try to get the hero pose, they can barely see it. So it's taken a while to watch ourselves on camera to learn what it looks like and what the moves relate to. Another rotation, Mike. Right here, it locks out. And here, the weight comes down on my shoulder. So to be erect, is this what you're looking for? Well, I just want to see it, to see if it, if it, because right now we're seeing, I see you crouch, right? Yeah. The hero poses kind of came from us just kind of striking poses and looking what looked best, and then them saying, yeah, hold that, hold that, and things from the comic book that they took and poses they want, and then there were some that we came up with our own, and just different looks and, you know, trying to show that you can see his character. If he's angry or if things are going good in the suit, they wanted to see that on camera. Roll camera. Action. Yes, of course there's going to be a great deal of digital work that has to be done to bring something like this to life on screen. But the fact of the matter is, is these suits truly exist. And they are going to be there. And they're going to be on the set. And they're going to be actors. And we are going to see the real thing along with the digital things. But when you as an audience are looking at it, screw you up a little bit so you really don't know what you're seeing. Is that real or is that digital? And then you let go. My background as a filmmaker is not in this sort of genre. I've dabbled a little bit in special effects in Zathura and Elf, but, but really I come from more of an independent background, primarily a comedic background. And so I really wanted to offer a, a human side that would fit in with, uh, with my sensibility of filmmaking. And in assembling the cast that I did between Robert Downey Jr. and Jeff Bridges, Gwyneth Paltrow, Terrence Howard, that's a cast that I would be happy to have in a, in a drama or a comedy. And to be able to have them to support a bigger than life superhero really offers the possibility to 
exceed what people's expectations might be of this type of genre. Listen to me, listen to me. You are like a little child sitting next to its father in a car with a plastic steering wheel turning the wheel. But its father's driving, Tony. Well, then let me out of the car. Join me. Let's get the hell out of start. We yeah, can raise all the funds we car. What do you mean? I was the one who arranged the injunction, Tony. Well, you could have saved a lot of trouble if you just... What? <laughs> Did I hear you? <laughs> no, that'd be great. That'd be great. I'm from the house. I think it was my uh, my manager, David Schiff, was uh, very excited about uh, this project. He was telling me about Iron Man. I said, oh, "Who's directing?" And he said, "John Favreau." I said, "Oh God, he's such a wonderful uh, director, writer, and actor." I said, "He'd be great to work with." And who's playing Iron Man? Robert Downey Jr. So wow, so that's that's a pretty good team right there. And uh, they said, keep me posted. This sounds like a good, a, you know, something I'd like to get involved with. Well, I'll let you warm up a little bit, and then we'll start throwing a little movement into it. Robert's a guy who takes a, he is very disciplined in his approach to everything he does. And he's really gotten his body and his mind into a very, you know, sort of clear, disciplined state. And that, that sort of carried over into how he prepared for the role. Wherever the direction is, just point kind of the opposite yeah. way. Right? Yeah, when you feel it going the other direction, act like you're gonna, like you're trying to counter it. Okay, go the other, there you go, just like that. I think he was very aware that he sort of had a burden in this film that he hadn't had before. He could sort of be charming and funny and come in and out of a movie and, and steal scenes in the past, but now he was a, you know, sort of an iconic superhero. It's good to eat about 10 minutes before this, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. I weight train crazily, and I do a lot of martial arts and yoga, kung fu, Wing Chun kung fu, but I was doing that anyway. About a year ago, I said, you know, I really want to put on some size, which isn't easy when you're in your late 30s and now I'm 41. I thought if I'm ever going to do a movie like this, I've got to do it quick before it's not embarrassing. But anyway, I, I feel like I've got a, a five to seven year window, and then if if it goes past that, then I'm sure um, uh, all the optical stuff and CGI will have advanced to make you look better. It's good. How's those legs, baby? <laughs> yeah, no, no, great shape. <laughs> legs are ready. We wear this. That's fine. Come forward. Me. Not even cross your face. Don't let your face get scratched on anything, all right? Robert Downey Jr.'s first reactions to the suit were, were extremely positive and he was thrilled. So that made us feel good because it, it is him, after all. He has to feel comfortable being in it. He enjoys the process. He wants to be in the suit as much as possible, which is fun. Yeah, that, that's what I wanted to see, just kind of walk around. Just like, yeah, once, once oh, they don't bend either, right? No, they, they just... Oh, they, I see. They're this, basically this rotational, thing. right? They have rotators and all the moves are hips are like this. Boom. I thought I'd been training for uh, all these years and I was pretty butch and I put on that Mark I suit, which is his kind of escape vehicle. And uh, I almost had a personality meltdown. It also just gives me a great respect for the stuntmen and the guys who are doubling, or I don't even want to say doubling, that me and, and the other fellows who are really playing Tony in, in the suits. Careful after it work, something just snapped off. And I'm not claustrophobic and it wasn't anything like that. It was just, I wore it for half an hour and I kind of ran around and the next day I felt like my spirit had been broke. <laughs> like, not, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it's like, these guys are seriously tough ass guys. Mark one suit days, we cancel the strength training. <laughs> the first time I saw him put on the helmet, I looked at him and I said, Robert, you are Iron Man. I mean, how amazing is that? For the rest of your life, you are you Iron Man. Nobody's gonna take that away from you. And he looks at me and goes, yeah, it's amazing. I think we need to add some rust to it, but 
Here we are. Three RTs. I love the lag bolts in there. That's great. Well, we're right about to start shooting, and we're rehearsing now. We have the run of the set. We actually started shooting second unit. We went down to the Santa Monica Pier and shot the Ferris wheel yesterday, and that was exciting because uh, we crossed a couple shots off our list of, of the thousands we need. There's a stress factor that kicks in, and that starts to go away and diminish once you capture each shot and each scene on film. But right now, all there is is anxiety, stress, and, and going over and over uh, again your, your plan of attack on this movie that's certainly the biggest movie I've ever been involved in making. I think we have about a 74-day shoot, and uh, day one is on Monday. Happy trails. Robert really wanted to play Tony Stark, and I really wanted him to play Tony Stark. It wasn't the most obvious choice from a studio's point of view. Unfortunately, Marvel is a new studio with a lot of freedom. We weren't dealing with the classic studio system where they have their lists that they generate. There was a lot of freedom to, to cast uh, the best person for the role because uh, fortunately with Marvel movies, the image of the superhero is in fact the big draw, the big star. And they've learned that they've had a lot of success in the past when they've hired people who were good, interesting actors and relied upon the name of the brand itself to, to sort of be the thing that becomes the rallying cry uh, from a commercial standpoint. You then are able to try to make the best movie possible. Luce, how dare you reduce the great objects of Carl? You're only alive because of his generosity. You are nothing, nothing! You understand me? People have drawn parallels to the character in his own life, but that wasn't by any means the decision uh, or part of the criteria by which we chose him. He's a tremendous American actor who has an incredible body of work and I think has the personality of Tony Stark. He has the look that sort of matches with the comic books. There's sort of a childlike quality to Robert. There's an imagination to Robert that is very similar to Tony Stark, who's an inventor. There's a sense of humor to Robert, which Tony shared, there's a confidence. There were just so many qualities as you began to look through the history of the comic books and who Tony Stark was and really who Robert is as an actor and as a person. But allowed the great Genghis Khan to rule from the Pacific to the Ukraine. The really fun part about the cave set is the dressing inside. What is life like when you're locked up in a room like that for like two or three months? And Robert, you know, brought a lot of his own personal experience to the cave too, which was fantastic. I mean, he, he taught us how you make tea in prison with the, the nice sock, or how you make coffee, uh, and how you play games, and you make backgammon sets out of nothing, things like that. With Robert in the, in the Iron Man suit, we tried to keep it at a minimum for him. We'd try and keep it at a partial suit for him so he could, he could do his acting because it's, it's so restrictive in that suit. And then we would let, you know, ILM fill in those blanks where the suit would be full. Stop. 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 Come on. Please. Get up. Please stop. Get up. As an actor, I've never gone through a process like this before, because usually you have a written page and you have a definite set idea of what it's going to be like. But we really found Jensen doing uh, rehearsals, sitting around the table and just talking. And uh, the fantastic thing about this project has been everybody's been so open. You, you maybe could shave about 90 seconds off your death would be nice, because it's a little uncomfortable. Yeah. Leaning over there. Well, Ninety seconds. A lot of you heard me. <laughs> Robert Downey is just a, it's just a jeweler. 
my girlfriend says, I, I think you're in love with him or something. Here we go. Ready and action. This is our last day in here. And I remember when these walls were white and before there was set dressing in. And we were trying to figure out what, what the heck we're gonna do in here. And it's a really, it's a really cool feeling uh, and sort of bittersweet, but satisfying when you say it's done. There's no more decisions to be made after, t after 10 months of trying to figure out what we're gonna do. But we started off here and, and now coming out of here, I, I feel like I understand who Tony Stark is more. I think Robert does as well. And hopefully when this whole sequence is cut together, people will totally buy that that Robert is in the Iron Man suit and that he built it and it makes sense. Uh, but you don't know. I mean, now as we just finished, I haven't seen any of the scenes cut yet. But I know that every day's work was really good and really strong and we did, and we did better than what was in the script. So we're just shooting a close-up of Robert because we can. And, uh, and then we're leaving the set behind for a second unit to shoot a lot of action stuff. But uh, this is fun. There's a lot of memories in here. In the Mark I suit was mostly Mike Justice. Mike is a strong, fit guy, and in the very beginning, he would be in it for a couple hours, and he literally was spent. It was so hard to do. I mean, imagine carrying around almost 100 pounds on your whole body and being asked to move around quickly and do fight scenes. But as he did it more, he got more in shape to do it, and there were days where he was in that suit, you know, 10, 12 hours. You know, at the end of the day, he go, man, I feel pretty good. Well, we finally got out of the cave, and now we're shooting at Disney Hall. It was uh, designed by architect Frank Geary. Uh, it's a very beautiful space. Should uh, give a, add a nice look to the movie. And since Tony Stark is, a, is an engineer and a designer, we felt that it was important that the locations tie into that sensibility. And, uh, and when this was available to us, everybody sort of jumped at the opportunity. We have to shoot here at night, so it's gonna be very gruesome brutal shooting hours because we're shooting from dusk till dawn uh, and it's this is the first uh, day that we're actually on nights so I think people will be fading fast. Mr. Stark, I was hoping I could get a reaction from you. How's panic? I was referring to your company's involvement in this latest atrocity. Hey, they just put my name on the invitation. I say the names and then I say my name. <laughs> And I'm like, holy crap, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing, it's one of those moments, like I'll literally, I will leave set and I'll call my agent and I'll be like, okay dude, here's, here, just, here's how I'm gonna break it down today. You know, like, uh, I don't know, a man called Jeff Bridges? Yeah, yeah, in a scene with them. You know, so it's exciting. And like last week I was like, get a scene with Terrence Howard and Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, I check it, like it's so good. Hey, Potts. What are you doing here? Just avoiding government agents. Are you by yourself? Where'd you get that dress? I, oh, it was a birthday oh, present from you, actually. Oh, God, I got great taste. Yes. You, uh, wanna dance? Oh, no. All right, Thank you. No. The scene at Disney Hall was my first scene in the film. I had taken quite a lot of time off to be with my children and have babies and everything, so. It was kind of intimidating the first scene back um, to be in this extremely backless dress. It was good that in that first scene that Pepper was kind of nervous and feeling a little bit uncomfortable. I had always wanted to work with Robert. It had been kind of one of my lifelong ambitions. And when I was talking to Robert before I accepted the role, he said, you know, aren't you tired of doing <laughs> these like great little movies that no one sees? Don't you want to be in a movie that people see? And I thought, you know, yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> you 
greedy. That's too much. You're a greedy human being. Uh, Stan, can we get you for, for the B-roll? Are you is everything okay here for you? Are we taking care of you? Or? <laughs> I have never been taken care of this well in my life. I'm just a little bit upset, <laughs> knowing that eventually we're going to have to go on, on there again and do some acting. Who's the best director of any uh, Marvel movie? Well, not only the best, but as far as I'm concerned, John Favreau That's is right. the only okay. director. <laughs> <laughs> Unless some other director gets me a half a dozen pretty girls. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to witness the art. Fantastic new coat. We like to keep them a bit wet, as they look even more fantastic. And action! How's it going, Half? Oh, sorry, thought you were someone else. <laughs> it's okay, I get this all the time. <laughs> Now then, I get it right, probably. Cut. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, that's a camera wrap on the creator of Iron Man. Yeah! All right, Stan Lee. When you hinge, I'm trying to get a camera over your right shoulder to get him. I have another camera over his left shoulder to get him. So what would you, uh, so I, I should be on this spot. I mean, yeah. This you're like yeah. I had never shaved my head, I always wanted to. I saw the, uh, the comic book character there and I said, oh, well this, you know, I'll, I'll do this. I'll talk to John about it. And John says, well, don't feel like you have to shave your head. And I said, oh, really? You know, I kind of wanted him to say, oh yeah, you got to shave your head, but he didn't. So we kind of chipped at it. You know, we kind of took it down steps at a time. And finally, you know, uh, took the plunge and shaved it all off. And uh, it felt, uh, you know, the most uh, Obadiah-like that way. Hey, what a surprise. I'm not going to say anything. Is that good? I, I got that. I'll see you inside. Now. All right, okay, yeah. And, oh, she's got a lot to talk about. Listen. And they say the best weapon is one you never have to fire. I respectfully disagree. I prefer the weapon you only have to fire once. That's how Dad did it. That's how America does it. <laughs> and it's worked out pretty well so far. <laughs> Wide, wide out the whole frame. That's, yes. That's yes. <laughs> For your consideration, the Jericho. The Jericho, 1001, 1000, bang. Here's Lone Pine, and it's doubling for uh, for what we what we're suggesting are the mountains of Afghanistan. I think they did Gunga Din out here. I know they did a lot of westerns out here. Uh, this particular angle works really well for for Afghanistan, but if you look different ways, you, you the different rock formations uh, make you feel like you're out in the west. Here we're on, we're on protected land, so there are a lot of parameters that we have to observe to shoot here. But but the trouble that we went through is well worth it because it really gives you a look like we traveled halfway around the world. You get to work with the guys at the top of the field, you just go, okay, that thing's gonna blow up in back of me and I'm gonna be okay. Or you get hit with like a little frag and everyone runs over because you're like, you know, the star of the movie and you're like, my God, man, 10 years ago, I could have gotten knocked off my ass and have stuff stuck in my skin and people would be like, all right, back to one. Because <laughs> if you're not down, then you're not out. I was pretty blown away by how much we were able to do at such close proximity and but I'll tell you you know it, it definitely helps you kick up some dust when you know what you're running away from. <laughs> John brought everything. John is the primal force behind Iron Man. He's easily half the character. He's infused himself into every department. He's an, I won't say he's a gentle giant because he's very formidable, but he is the most composed person in a position of unimaginable stress that I've ever seen. He's so gracious and so evolved. Robert, you're just, you're just you're such a good actor. You got that? <laughs> okay.
That said, he's a pain in my ass. He's checking his goddamn Blackberry and texting and putting things up on MySpace while I'm out there dying. But he's that kind of big brother, too. You know, it's like he didn't call me out to, you know, pitch for his team and then, like, come and, you know, ice my wrist when it got sore. He's like, you're a grown man. This is going to be really hard. I told you it was. And sometimes I'm a million percent there for you, and sometimes I'm just going to watch you do whatever you're going to do because it's not up to me to take care of your feelings. You're a grown man. That's pretty good. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I try. It's pretty good. Working with actors in the military sense, I don't try to make them warriors uh, from the ground up. I, what I do is I focus in on the skills required to shoot the scene. They are actors, after all. They only need to know how it's done, and then as actors, they will pick up on it. I started just pushing down, and you know, these things are, are firing like 40, 40 rounds a second. And I'm holding it down, but that will make the barrel very high. You know, so you have to do it in bursts. And his whole thought was, die, mother, die, mother. Huge gun. I mean, you feel your teeth shatter afterwards. It's incredible. like this when we scouted it. We're going to shoot uh, Tony landing in the sand dunes after he escapes from the, uh, from the cave and then walking through the desert. We got two marine helicopters coming out here. I don't know if we're going to be able to land them. Here we go. Pictures up. It was sandstorming and it was kicking up so hard and I just remember Laying there, buried waist deep in all this gear. And, and I just remember kind of, I was inside the helmet, and I just had this great moment of gratitude to kind of the elements and what a privilege it was to be able to be there playing this guy with the caliber of people I was working with. Special effects, we got this. <laughs> hey. Three cakes to fill all the candles. <laughs> Light it up. I just said, wow, man, what a cool deal. What a cool suit, what a great crew, what a blast. Yeah. Tony Stark. here in the sand dunes. Uh, it's been a windstorm. There have been a couple of semis slipping over on the highway. The winds were kicking up to about 50, to 50 miles per hour. So everybody's making do. We all goggled up. And uh, everybody's been a real trooper, and they're out here working. We've had cranes swinging out of control, and today we're just on sticks because it was just too windy for any, any equipment more than that. Day, very indicative, honestly, of what the uh, circumstances are like in Afghanistan. So it actually kind of, uh, you know, rang true, I guess, to what things are really like there. Uh, well, 395, something must have flipped, and um, they had to send a helicopter for me. Yeah, that was the ride. It's incredible. The doors are open. My assistant almost cried. Brought in uh, a couple uh, HH-60 Pavehawk helicopters. Action, We're actually, you know, pararescue men and real helicopters and, and, and shooters on that, on that, you know, that do that stuff for real. Uh, came in, were part of that scene.
when we get out of that, that helicopter, the first breath you take in is half filled with sand and your lungs fill up with it immediately and the cameras are on you and we've got 10 minutes to get this whole shot and you've got to run across the desert. Now, if anybody's ever ran in the sand on the beach, they know how hard that is. Now, imagine running up a sand dune with your lungs half filled with sand. The second day when Raza recovers the suit, the winds were so violent that we couldn't really use any equipment. And, uh, and Lou, Lou Desposito, our executive producer, was like, you know, let's go to a recover set, as you would if it rained. I felt that all of that wind, that heavy wind, was a, was a very haunting image. And so we put goggles on all the bad guys and wrapped them with, with, with scarves so that, you know, to help protect the, the performers. And also that's really what they would wear, and we just let it play. And as a result, it has such a great visual quality that if you wrote that into a script, you could never really achieve that. You can't, you know, you can't put enough Ritter fans in there to make that kind of wind. But when it really lands there in your lap, I think as a director, you have to take advantage of those opportunities. Time for Iron Man to get out of Dodge. This walk of destruction, what is it like being inside that suit, shooting flames with the armor on? How does it feel? Oh, it's, it's an awesome feeling. It feels cool. <laughs> powerful, you're just burning stuff, nothing. You almost have a false sense of security because you really feel super protected by the suit in a way that the boys over at Stan Winston designed it. I can move pretty well in it for as much as it weighs. And, and the special effects guys rig me up, just making me look like a bloody stud so I can flow out some flames. And yeah, it's, a, it's an awesome feeling. Take a couple of hits and then, like, you, you, you know what? It's, it's history. This one I'm doing for my kids. They're going to watch this and go, that's you, Dad? I'm just dating. Hi, Taylor. Hi, Tristan. Hi, Mom. <laughs> awesome. I love this. Just from wear and tear, we got a little tear in one of the lines and it spit fuel, which being under pressure kept spraying on my legs and I ignited. And I kind of felt, well, that feels a little hot. Maybe not. Yeah. Yep, it's hot. It was, a, you know, an unfortunate thing, but Keith Boulard and Tommy Harper had all the boys set out to take care of me. They put me out. What's going on there, coach? I'm finding my character. <laughs> the inner driver? Yes. What are you doing today? I'm playing Happy Hogan. At the time, it seemed like a good idea. Let's try to make my hair look like how it looks in the comics. This is it. This is, this is what you get. It's not too dissimilar to your regular haircut. Is it not? Just straight. No, we're, gonna, we're gonna put a little product in here and straighten it out. It's a little thicker. It's more of a cameo in this film. I wanted to sort of give myself a way to be in the film. As a director of a big movie, there isn't really a lot of latitude to do much of a performance, but I was able to sort of uh, weave my way in and out of scenes. He's, um, he's an ex-boxer who, who's Tony Stark's driver slash confidant bodyguard kind of a sidekick of sorts, although he's not a superhero in any way. And uh, he doesn't crack a smile, and so he ironically is given the name Happy. And it's more for the comic book fans to see that, you know, we're sort of trying, you know, in a way to incorporate as much of the, uh, the source material as we could, being that this is the first Marvel movie made for Marvel fans. And here it is, this is it. This is Happy Hogan. I hope the fans like it. <laughs> you like good. it, Pete? It's great. I really do. The real reason I'm doing this, I just broke it to Gwyneth that, that I marry her. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Okay. 
Edwards Air Force Base is here about 70 miles north, uh, northeast of Los Angeles, and John wanted to include Edwards Air Force Base in the story specifically just because it has such a proud heritage of flight tests. They really wanted to tie that into sort of the research and development aspects of Stark Enterprises. So we, we did a lot of filming there. We shot there for three days. We, um, we shot on a C-17 cargo plane. We, we brought in an F-22 and a Global Hawk as set dressing. And we used about 300 airmen and actually Marines as well as, as extras. So you've got first look, one shot, one kill. We're at the merge even before they know we're there. Terrence Howard, uh, we opted in this film to make him a, an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, although he was a member of the military. In the comic books, he wasn't somebody of that stature. But he was somebody that bonded pretty early with Tony Stark. As a matter of fact, he was involved with his rescue, from what I remember. We tried to incorporate that into the film in a way as sort of an homage to the books, but we really wanted to flesh out the character even more. And Rhodey uh, becomes War Machine uh, if you follow the, the, the course of the books. And, and as we sort of look forward to see this as a chapter in a series of films, if we could be so lucky, uh, I think that, that following Terrence Howard as he becomes a superhero in his own right is something that I'm really curious and interested in. That lovely lady you woke up with, what was his name? Um, I think it was Ivan. No, it was your sister. Right. <laughs> Come on, give us a few seconds, you guys. Pleasure to meet you all. Soon after that shoot, those guys cycled over to Afghanistan. So no joke, those are, are, are really tough guys and, and they get a real tough job to do. And it was really nice to see uh, Terrence and John and Robert interact with them and, and just uh, be really just humbled by what, what a tough job those guys got and what real pros they are. It's nice to see you. What? Do you know? Yeah. One more? OK, of course well, again. one more. Guys, going again right away? The workshop was always the most important set for me. It was the space that was going to tell you before he got captured and builds the Mark I suit that he's a guy who, who likes fabricating, he likes working with his hands. We have him working on a 32 Ford that we show in a picture that he's working with his dad on. And it just shows that he's a bit of a gearhead. He's a guy who, not only is he a genius in, as far as design goes, but he actually has a hands-on knowledge of how to build things. And he's an inventor, but the type of inventor doesn't just work with a pencil. That was important to make that leap so that it didn't just jump into fantasy land when he was in a cave and builds the suit. That he makes a breakthrough that was inevitable because he has a mind that is capable of these kind of realizations. So we put together a shop that would be any car builder's dream. We have everything from old English wheels that look like they were passed down from generation to generation. Maybe they were his dad's that were passed down. And then you also have like CNC machines that are sort of state of the art, you know, or plasma cutters. And everything we figured was tied in and automated to the brain of the house. So I wanted to create a real mix of high tech and low tech. Why, why are you hustling me out here? Where are you going? You got plans? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. You don't like me? What? <laughs> I don't like you. I don't like it when you have plans. Well, I'm allowed to have plans on my birthday. So there you is go. Is it your birthday? It is. Again? Isn't that funny? Same day as last year. Wow. Yeah. You're probably feeling coolness. Unless it. Uh... I was definitely not a comic book reader, but my brother was, so I Here we go. Up. I grew up with Marvel Comics around the house, and um, my brother had Spider-Man underoos and Spider-Man sheets and Spider-Man everything um, from a very young age, and he was definitely into comic books, so I was exposed to it, although, you know, I'm a girl, let's face it, so. Do you feel it? you feel the warm? Oh, oh, pus! Okay. Don't worry about it. It's not pus, it's an inorganic organic plasma discharge from the device, it's not from my body. Oh, it smells. It's basically it's making a, a very tall upside down U. I'm a huge military channel and Sergeant Rock. I mean, so we, superheroes are great. Superheroes who manufacture weapons and then build one that they wear and use, to me, is, is just a complete nerdgasm. 
how we're ready. I think the band's ready to go on. So uh, without further ado, I present Robert Downey Jr. and the and the Boot Brigade. In an origin story of a superhero, you have certain responsibilities, one of which is, you know, showing how the hero came to be. And it takes a lot out of a movie to have that kind of burden. But what it gives you is the opportunity to allow the audience to sort of become the hero with the hero. And I have the most fun as a viewer when I see the learning curve of a hero. There's a tendency to want to just go right for the fighting and right for the action. But I know my favorite part of the first Spider-Man film was watching him come to terms with his powers, learn how to swing from his webs. And I, you know, I referred back to a lot as we met and went to pre-production meetings talking about what the set pieces would be. I thought you said you were done making weapons. It is. This is a flight stabilizer. It's completely harmless. Three, two, one, go! Uh... Well, watch where you point your flight stabilizer. It's really dangerous. I like the guy that he's probably just as likely to kill himself trying to save people as he is to do the right thing. What? As far as Robert Downey doing stunts, he wants to keep doing more and more, and I gotta keep reining him back because he's very game to just keep right on going. We should be following him while he's going. So when he hits the wall and falls down, it could be like a, a, a beat of, of no movement, and it's just punctuated by the blast. It's a, it's a timing thing, so. I like to think that I can do a ton of stuff, and I'm, I'm pretty game and physically able, and probably should be for the next, like I said, five to seven years. So, um, but then I'll talk to Tommy, and he'll be like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're not gonna have you do that. I could do that, he goes, no. I could. Well, maybe you could, but I wouldn't like it. It, it still hurts, it, but it hurts every day. <laughs> getting up looking like this. It hurts in here, emotionally. But I'm doing better. I'm doing better. Can I go now? Okay. Thank you. Um, we're about to do uh, uh, Tony Stark experimenting with the combination of boots and gauntlets. This is his first successful flight in his workshop. Uh, Robert here has done a lot of training on this wire rig, and the tests we've done were pretty successful. Ready and action. You're off right here. Frame up on me. Good. Day 11, test 37, configuration 2.0. For lack of a better option, dummy is still on fire. Safety, if you douse me prematurely, I swear to God, I will donate you. You'll be at a city college. All right, we're gonna start off really nice and easy. Don't talk when I'm talking. 1% capacity in three, two, one. Steady. I've done wire work both as an actor and as a director in the past. I think people have been seeing wire work for so long that whether consciously or subconsciously they could tell where the pick points are, they could tell where the wires are attached, and even if you use, you know, computers to paint everything out, there's something about the physics of it that is unconvincing to me. And I was very skeptical if we could use it at all or if we take the audience out of the movie. What we did was we developed a way by which the character was picked or supported by his feet. So he wasn't being suspended by a center of gravity or his hips or his back, as is usually done in these films. 
Hey, uh, sorry. I'll clean up later. His feet are supporting his weight, so it actually looks like he's being supported by the blast of the repulsors in the bottom of his boots. And you can see the dynamics as he's flying through the air feels much truer to what the real physics of flying being powered by your feet would be. <laughs> Learning one's powers is always the most fun. Okay. What would happen to you or to me or to anybody putting this thing on and trying to operate it? It's like surfing. I feel pretty clumsy in the beginning. And here is, he's wearing an engine, pretty elaborate thing. Yeah, I can fly. <laughs> oh, man. Ready, and light, and action. Something interesting happened when we saw a black and white rendering of the Mark III. It looked kind of silver, and uh, that started our wheels turning, and then we, we, we sort of backed into the design of the Mark II, which is sort of a chromed aircraft aluminum, sheet metal-looking prototype version of the Mark III. And then we started incorporating exposed rivets, and because of the wonderful finishes that they were able to create through the chroming process and nickel plating process over at Stan Winston, it really has a very unique look, and that's something different from anything you've seen in the books before. But it helped provide sort of an intermediate step between the Mark I armor and the, and the final Mark III design. Tommy, how much is that car? $50,000. It's a replica of a uh, 1967 Cobra SC. Where is it made? In Poland at a uh, MiG factory. <laughs> that brings a tear to my eye. If you like cars at all, that hurts. Over the course of the movie, um, I, I dropped a bit of weight. I started off, I remember when I was scouting, I was quite a bit heavier than now. My assistant, Karen, helped me out. She brought me a lot of meals. I didn't spend a lot of time at craft service or, or going to catering. And over the course of the film, I lost, I lost weight. I lost probably about 75 pounds, maybe more, up, up, give or take, depending on where I'm at now. And, and I, was in the, I wanted to lose weight because I was playing Happy Hogan in the film. And so I, I wanted to hit a certain weight, lose a certain amount of pounds, and I just kept going. And there were problems, too, because my wardrobe would change in size over the course of the film. And uh, even my wig size changed. It's amazing. Everything, everything sort of changes. Your shoe size changes. I have real hair, but I wanted to have other, I wanted to have cool hair. So uh, straight hair, I never had, like a real shock of straight hair, like, like in the comic books. I had a wonderful time working with Peter Billingsley, uh, who is a close friend of Fabro's, and I, I, uh, I got him to shave his head bald, not as bald as mine. I didn't want him to upstage me. It's like, yeah, it really is. Is yours like velvety too? Ooh. Oh, yeah, that's nice. We both have good heads of hair. <laughs> Peter wanted to shave his head to, to look a little different, make age him up a little bit. When you threw a lab coat on the guy, he looked like he was 14 years old, and so shaving his head and throwing glasses on him and growing a mustache gave him a little bit more of a distinguished look. I love this. Uh, there's an ID, probably a couple pens to watch. In approaching this cameo, I really wanted to send a message to the other actors who I felt were really phoning in their performances that, you know, guys, let me show you a level of commitment to acting. The camaraderie that John uh, that John nurtures on a set is uh, is to ad lib. 
you don't see that all the time on movies this size where somebody's on wires or you're up against a green screen or you can't move too much because there's going to be a computer effect uh, and it can get very rigid. It was very important to John that the film not feel rigid, that the film feel and have a flow to it and have a sense of fun to it. Always believable, but never too, uh, too overwhelmingly pretentious or self-serious. We're ironmongers. We make weapons. It's my name on the side of the building. And what we do keeps the world from falling into chaos. The spirit in which it was shot and the way we did it was like you might do a, uh, a small independent art film <laughs> in a funny sort of way. I think you're just not towards the end of the movie. I think we're just starting to kind of get up to speed and start to kind of relax and uh, have faith in our this process that we <laughs> the way we do it. Each time we would do one of these scenes, there would be a great sense of relief, like, man, oh, we got through that one, we pulled it out, you know, how did we do it? This technology, it comes along once in a generation. And it's a gift. I think, I think of him saying, either that or I can okay, take it, and you one. said I said no, and I put it in front of you. If I have one, if I have one drink, could we move on? Yes. And he takes it. Takes a drink. Now, do, do we have cheers before that? That'd be good. We have one drink? Okay, here. Okay. So please, and roll sound. And boom up. Boom up. Boom up. Ready and action. Honey, I hate it when we fight. Good morning, Mr. Soldier. Soldier, I'm not mad. I'm just I said I was sorry. Thanks. I don't want to hear you. I don't, you, what more you do don't need respect than yourself. You oh, definitely boy. know you don't respect me. If John I'm... recognizes that the script is a skeleton. The comic book is a skeleton. You know, what we are creating is real life. So he allows it to grow and to improv and to become something alive and three-dimensional. I want to, do I want to be sober, fresh. Okay? I know what I'm doing. I live for this. This is business travel. I don't got a throttle between my legs going, you, you know, know hopping Just for my... Just do what you want to do. Just leave me alone. <clears throat> Join me. One drink. To business. I said no. To the future. To the Air Force. Will it get you to shut up? The look of the film is something that, that you know, is, is as much a part of the franchise as, as the character himself. And as a director, it's one of the elements that you have a lot of control over. Thing, maybe she does one move and then Sarah can come in and do it. I'm not a cinematographer. I don't, I, I wouldn't know how to, to light a scene as a cinematographer or a gaffer. I have a lot of respect for what they do. But I do understand a, a look that I like. And in hiring uh, Maddie Lee Batique, who I've been wanting to work with for a while, and I've been a fan of his since his much smaller films, he brings a certain, uh, a, a certain style to it, a certain grittiness, and he's also able to give it a big movie look. And he understands how much a priority reality is, and how the challenge for this movie was to ground it in reality, because it's such a fantastic story, such a fantastic character, that your job as a director is to make it personal. Welcome home, Mr. Scott. Thanks, Jarvis. It's been a long time. You know, there are two ways to go. One is just to create a spectacle that people could, you know, munch popcorn and ogle at and enjoy, and that certainly is a lucrative proposition. But as a filmmaker who's going to be working on this thing for two years and possibly other films to come, it's important for me to, to have a, an aspect to it that I could really buy into beyond just being a, a trifle, you know, being a, just a treat for the audience. You also want to do something where you're telling a story and maybe speaking to something and going for something a little bit more. And the way Maddie lights and the way that uh, Mike Riva designs the sets, it, it brings reality to it. Sir, you have 1,713 new voice messages, including three from the mantra. About the time that uh, we cast Robert Downey Jr., I was thinking about the house and trying to figure out what kind of design it should be. And even though we had decided on this kind of angular, flat, metallic, hard-edged look, the idea that Robert Downey Jr. has a, he, he comes with a certain vulnerability with him. And uh, it may sound strange, but we redesigned the notion of the house after casting him. I thought that he would be more suitable in something that architecturally mirrored who he was, a little softer inside, a little bit more susceptible, a little more vulnerable. There was a certain vulnerability about him. So I thought round is nice, it's more elegant, and it, uh, it just seemed a little bit more womb-like.
when this project first came along, they gave me a bunch of the comic books and history of the characters and so forth. And I said, ooh, Obadiah Stane's got this wild suit, Ironmonger suit, and all these different things. And I got kind of excited about that again. They kind of they kidded me. We'll, we'll counter your move. So whenever you, wherever you move, we'll kind of go with you and take the weight of the suit itself. You have rotation by yourself, Jeff. Yeah, I've got it now by myself, right? No, you can spin. The, spin the, your way. The there you is, go. That that's, well. that's always just you. Then when I met with John the first time, he said, oh, no, you're, uh, you don't get to wear a suit. <laughs> and I kind of went, oh. And it, because it was the Mandarin was, the, was originally the band, there was going to be like two different bad guys. And I said, oh, yeah. Okay, well, you know, let's see, you know, how it works out. And then the scripts were being worked on, and it came back. And he says, "Oh, it looks like uh, you wanted to wear a suit. Now you've you've got your uh, you've got your suit." I said, "Well, great." I think it was the most strange for Gwyneth, who, although she had worked on a green screen show, Sky Captain, she never really worked on an effect show. And she said that that was very different than this. Because in this film, you know, she's looking at like a 10 foot tall robot that's being operated by puppeteers in front of her, and she's having explosions go off behind her, and windows being blown out, and lights going crazy, and things melting down. And she was right in the heart of it, running through sets at full tilt and with things blowing up behind her, and she'd never experienced anything like that before. I told her, I told her it was remains of the day too when we signed her. <laughs> when I did Sky Captain, that was very surreal because there was literally nothing. There was nothing practical. There were no props and no sets. And um, that was just sort of like doing experimental theater or something, you know, off, off Broadway because you were just in a room with some actors and this, I was so used to working with actors and, and real sets that when they said, okay, now like a big monster's coming out of the ground that I felt like, oh my God, look, Wayne, this look. is so silly. And John said, oh, don't worry, you know, you just, so I just thought, right, well, you just have to really go for it. The first half hour of being in the Iron Man suit is like um, the coolest Halloween you ever had, except you're alone in the trailer before they call you on a set or whatever, or you're getting ready and you just catch a glimpse and you go, that's right, grandma would be proud. And then because it's not really, it's designed for guys to wear, but I'm not a stunt man. And most of the stunt men aren't doing, you know, 65 scenes in the next three weeks. <laughs> most of them are young enough to not have a teenager at home. It was tough and as the and as we went further and further along I realized like I could wear the suit all the time, but I can't wear the suit all the time and be an effective actor. I'm sorry, did that interrupt your flow? I guess this is a draw. In the last couple weeks of shooting I was like, you know what? I made it this far, I need to sleep, I want to eat pasta, I don't care if I'm puffy tomorrow, don't put me in a t-shirt, kiss my ass. I did all that stuff because then the job is you drop the saddlebags and you just, you charge out of Dodge City, you know, because you want to get out without 
getting your ass bit by a rattlesnake. Now it's time for both of us to go. That's the law of nature, Tony! Here we are out in front of Caesar's Palace, the third movie I've done here. And uh, we're exhausted. We're doing a death split, which means you start at midnight and go into the next day. We tried to turn around. Everybody stayed up as late as they could, gambling and partying last night, and tried to sleep all day. I, for one, was not able to sleep all day. And I have to act and direct today. So. This could all go to hell in a handbasket on our last day of principal photography. But here we are, this is the big finish line. We always knew that if we got here, we'd be in good shape. So it's a bit of a celebration. It's gonna be a fun scene. We're gonna start outside, then go inside, and here he is, Tony Starks. Tony Starks. I'm just saying, we don't need sleep, we got talent. That's right. Work it, work it, work it. Winner is! I'm just so proud of everybody and, and satisfied and the whole deal. I mean, in my psyche right now, it's that thing of like someone was saying the last day of high school and you know, you kind of just can't wait to throw your hat up, but then you're like, what am I gonna do with the rest of my life? And um, I just remember last, you know, October, November and meeting John regarding this and then screen testing and then pre-production to me, like most of us were burnt by the time pre-production was done because we, we prepped ourselves into a tizzy. And then there's starting in the first two weeks in the cave and then going to Lone Pine and then there's Air Force Base. I mean, it's the problematic thing of looking at a, at a schedule or looking at what your, anyone, looking at what their life is for the next three months. It's like, this can't be done. Thank you, everybody. You know, every movie has its uh, trials and tribulations. We did encounter a snowstorm in the middle of a desert in the cave scene, which was very odd. Uh, we did have sets that blew away and blew down. But it, it actually, the movie uh, uh, gods were with us most of the time. And uh, while it was always daunting, it went fairly smoothly, which was great for our first production, very important for our first production. Ladies and gentlemen, John Favreau, director of Iron Man. That's a testament to John, to the crew that we put together, and for the cast, who were always game, who could always maneuver through whatever circumstances were thrown at them. And, you know, we did. We came in uh, on time and under budget. Take a look at this. Take a look at this. I know. I want you to go to SU 130. Okay. It's looking good. And Dan extended it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This just came in? Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It came in yesterday. Oh, wow. It's coming along nice. There's your little ribs moving. All right. Let's do that again. Let's put up the uh, expensive cropper. There's those that, that actually does help a lot, John. That little that little uh, that little rib event. Yeah, we got to rack down. I want to see under the floor a little bit too, because mm. that helps. Well, they also added. That. What I like is the heels, you know, that that we had on the Mark II as well. Mm -hmm. They added it here, which we didn't have in the version, and that's very cool. The thing I think that makes the biggest difference is they have the arm actually operating the screw. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think right. And when that one too. There's one on the on the right there. Yeah. Yeah. As we go up, just take it take it a few frames forward. That thing's coming off of there. I almost want that to linger a little bit more so we see that. It's almost happening out of the frame. Gantry it is. It is yeah. happening out of frame. Yeah, so would, we should just delay that when that piece comes out. Right. If we could delay that event. Because it closes as soon as we're on it. Yeah, it's because there's something right at the beginning. You want something sort of in the middle to go. So you just go, yeah, the party started. But it's it's definitely cool. It's definitely it's going in the right It's much better, and that actually yeah. helps a lot with those little flippies. All right, anything else to look at? 
<laughs> no, is that where we get out? I thought it was longer. Why is the trim so short? Uh, well, yeah, it's on the step. It's on the step. It, that looks like it's very short. I felt some of what was cool about it was that was that. Yeah, the. Okay. I am in the mocap suit in this. This is a shot we were trying to get the first reveal right. He moves a little How's too that? much like Happy Hogan. <laughs> <laughs> Do you open up? So you have it in the cut there? Take it to now. Do you have the previous? That's way short. So here's my question. To do, clearly we're, we're going down a dead end road here because we're, we're changing the performance on this thing. I like the camera angle, but now Dan's cutting out. I'm assuming going downstairs. I'm not going to tell him, hey, get me one more half a step. That breaks the shot. Well, should we try and get Dan here for a minute and maybe at least he can tell us? We can, but I'm, I'm, I know what he's going to say. He's going to say, why would I have him just go a half a step? It, it throws off the reveal. This is all about the reveal. So right now I'm cutting in on the middle of a head turn, and the head turn's throwing off the reveal. So let's change that, and maybe that'll yeah. take some of the curse off of it. But we're now cutting even shorter the reveal, and the whole idea of this was to make it longer. Which is why when we did the mocap performance, we looked at the full length of the plate right. to see what we had. Right. And then after we did that, we found out that we couldn't get it. Exactly. Check it out. It's cool. It's not. This stuff is looking freaking awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. That's a tap, too. It what? It is a tap. Really? It's a tap. Can we yeah. final it? So can we talk about... Should I put a bullet in there? Yeah. You guys what, what like the texture it? of... Um, you like the texture of the gantry? I love everything bubble? about it. Yeah? Okay, good. I love the animation, too. All those pieces coming in. Okay, that's SU95. SU95. Right? Uh, uh. Oh, I, I think I buy that more. It, I think it's got a clap. Clo that's got to sort of clap more close. See how it's sliding? It's got to go. It's got to. It's got to slide in and then go kunk, kunk. Yeah. Kunk, yeah. yeah. And I think there should be some sort of under gap to it too, which is starting, starting to imply. Mm -hmm. but I think it's gonna be good. Should there be backs to it or something so it doesn't just feel like a... I, I gotcha. Do you know what I mean? So it should it should be seamed around here? So, something that should be another sort of maybe like cranial element because mm -hmm. it just feels very 2D with... It, it just feels very... The whole thing is it's Iron Man. It should be... Yeah, it should be tough, strong. Do we want to have one spin or no spin at all? I like the spin. Well, remember we were talking about him going out upside down? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what we had talked about. Like he was sort of coming out upside down and not spinning. The spin feels a little bit like when he, in the dog fight, pencil, maybe. Yeah. So that's what we talked about. Mm -hmm. So I feel like he's out of frame. I feel like it's a little too, a little too self-conscious of a move too for showy. him. A little too showy. Yeah. He's okay. Like, we, where am I going now, Dan? To, um, Let's go down to the mix. mix. And then hopefully we can sit and get with Dan and we can look at 6 to 7 ADR. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Yeah. The first time? Yeah. It is amazing. Have these posters? I love the happy. He says, he says this one here. Yeah, yeah. Bring that down. This one here. There's a little tiny room. And here it is, the Akira Kurosawa. Next on stage. Let's see if he's in here. The sound? I like the, the the actual RT sound itself. Well, no, I was only bringing you in for that. Let's see that one more time. The RT we haven't really mixed yet. Good. Yeah. Let me see again. I think it's good. So those 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 sound like servos, right? So the layers I, I'm expecting that we'll get to now are going to be the the winding up of the RT. Right, also. and also movement, you know, presence and sort of servo slash plasma sort of type of sound for him moving around Good. as well. And because this is like when we're seeing the RTs being used against people too, it's the first time we're really showing it. Right. We might want to sweeten it with like, on top of the sound we have, we should have something in our pocket like a thunder crack or something to sort of bury in there, kind of like we did with the pig squeal and stuff. Right, 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 yeah. Just to give it a little more pop if it's okay. not, because they really, it has to be a little more overwhelming than it is later. 
Right, right. It has right. to have its own, like, signature, holy shit, this guy. It's like the first time Dirty Harry fires the Magnum. Right, right. It's got to really be a special one. And don't worry about consistency. Worry sure, about impact. for Iron Man and said, can you help us? It's Iron Man, are you kidding me? I mean, I, I'm a, of course I want to work on Iron Man. I mean, of course you want to do that. I mean, I love Marvel comics. I love Spider-Man. I, I used to read Iron Man. John Nelson called and said, you know, can you guys come in and look at some of these interfaces? There's a lot of text you can't quite read and it's all very, it's very technical, but I wasn't advancing the story. But this is the kind of thing Different ideas for how those interfaces look. You know, John always used the reference of, um, you know, the, the, the iPhone kind of thing, the, the sort of simplicity. He felt like Tony Stark would, would be really visually sophisticated and not just like a technological nerd, but he would have a real sense of style. And all the products in his house would have a real sense of, of his high design sensibility. Connect to the Cisco, have it reconfigure the shell metals, use the gold titanium alloy from the Seraphim tactical satellite. That should ensure fuselage integrity while maintaining power to weight ratio. Got it? Yes. Shall I render using proposed specifications? Throw me. So we want to show that the computer is processing something specific to that, whereas the interfaces prior, some of them, just looked complicated, but they didn't look specific to the story, and John was very specific about, you know, you have to hit this story point, even though it's a pan from one monitor to another, to another, and you only have, you know, three seconds, I still want to get what, what's going on with those monitors. The beginning, beginning designs on the hologram. That's that. But then they let us work on the main title, and we came up with a ton of stuff. We had the idea of the title itself kind of forming like... As a company our size, we always like to put our best foot forward and get as much out there as we can, make a really good impression on the pitch. So, you know, we pitch a lot of different styles and a, a huge range of things from, you know, the shiny, glossy kind of look to um, something kind of gritty and textural. When I'm involved in an effort of that scale, I always like to just do something completely different, knowing that those stand a great chance, but maybe there's, you know, an opportunity for something else. I had a board that had um, flying. The interface, he says, I am Iron Man, and then the, the HUD display encases him and he comes up around him and then he takes off. The kind of brief that I gave the people here is that I thought when he says I'm Iron Man, it should be like a celebratory thing, like you leave the theater and you're, you know, you're pumped. And I also thought about, um, I liked the interaction of the robots. And so we had a board that was all about type that was kind of being, you know, very complex kind of situation with type being made by robots. And John felt like there wasn't a lot of detail material of the suit itself. So he very much responded to a board that was all about the inner mechanics of the suit. But we had this little motion test and uh, John saw it and he really liked it. And this is what we had showed to them the first meeting. I decided, well, you know, maybe it would be kind of interesting to do something that's like a video game, kind of wireframe sort of looking. And Tempest, that's it was, it was fully Tempest. The, the color, the look of it, it was that and a combination of Tron. I liked Tron a lot at the time too, and a game called Battlezone. So I was a, I was a real, uh, I, I would go into arcades all the time as a kid to spend like $40 and, you know, and quarters at a time on these things. And that was a lot then, you know, to, to do. I'm kind of dating myself. 
John saw it and he really liked it. And I think he wanted to move away from the kind of language of Spider-Man and, and, and have something that was more kind of funky and, and, and now. Kevin was a little bit more, um, you know, he was wondering if, it became a conversation then about what's the level of rendering. Well, it looks retro, and John's like, no, that retro is, that's, that's what's cool. That's what's cool about it. And talking to the director, at that point, we were kind of, we were going back and, and forth so much, you know, between um, what can it be. We went a little bit too far, I think, in the sort of printed kind of look, and it ended up looking like paper in a way, so we were kind of unhappy with that. Fortunately, after showing them that, they didn't like that very much. We went right back to it. What was super cool for us was that ILM had given us this, they gave us the CG model for Iron Man. So you can imagine the detail in that. I mean, we're peeling apart layer after layer. It was just endless. I think these guys had spent months at this thing. But it was so fun to be able to just take that plate, you remove it, there's this mesh, you know, you remove that. There's all these like little screws and bolts and nuts and all of that, which is really evident in this shot here. It's crazy what these guys did. They just, you know, it's like real machine work. They just went and did every single piece. The detail these guys put in, it's just such a labor of love from them. They really, really figured this thing out. You know, like we wanted a little bit of a hint of film here, you know, and, and then it, we just kind of give it a lot of nice grain and texture and all that kind of stuff that Ilya had come up with this look, you know, to um, give it a little bit of an imperfect quality. And they wanted us to put War Machine in there. So we found a good opportunity to do that, I think, on this here. Dave Reiner had modeled this. So all of, all of this, was made here at Prologue. Um, we just we had a couple reference photos to go off of to be able to do that. And then here, um, I like even like laser tag. You know how they have all the black light kind of thing. My ki kids play that. They love that stuff. But I think it's not as popular anymore. But I thought it might be kind of fun to explore that just a little bit right here. So uh, here we are. Okay. You guys are working extremely hard, I know, but get, I get think- Get a close up of this part. Working extremely hard, but one of the things that we do need to do is kind of formulate how we're going to finish now, and how we're, what, what is our task at hand uh, to get this movie so that we can clearly have prints by the end of March. The one relentless thing Calendar-wise, is vis effects. That's the thing that once we run out of time, we're done. Right. And so, I want to make sure that they're not waiting because oftentimes they have people hot bunking and working around the clock at these vendors. And if I don't get in there when they need me, absolutely, there are people waiting. And at a certain point, the bell's going to ring, and we're not going to get those shots in. And that's honestly the most concerning part of the process to me right now. As of today, we have 162 outstanding shots, um, out of which. 22 were always the Gomera ones for March right. 21st. So outstanding is 140. The caveat, though, really ultimately is going to be Iron Man's voice because no one's ever seen it. it actually, is it something that really works yet? Yeah. So it's like one of those things, it's, it's just like your VFX, until they work, they don't work, and, and it's like... Uh, and it could mean pulling out a lot of lines or adding lines and stuff like that. Yeah, the character of the film just is radically altered, so that, that's the one that he shared discovery really. that he'll have a lot yeah. to say about. Is and it that's, the same for Monger, too, or no? Probably. Yes, it is. Because he hasn't heard Real 4 yet, where you're actually... And, and maybe even John yeah, there's start, some lines. It doesn't really start till Real 5, because right. we don't use okay. Iron Man flight, voice yeah. in First Flight. Now, the space battle stuff, the st because it's such an important story point and because there's so many moving parts between ADR, performance, robot voices, the effects themselves, the music, all the things are going to sort of come together yeah. and have to pay off in a way that I'm not completely confident in. A big thing that we're going to have to dial and understand as we see the shape of it in the cut and as all the finals lay in is the degree of ice that's on him. And that's going to be all Ben over there. And that's going to be something where I think we're going to be 
really dialing in and out more than we have with most of the shots we've been working with them. Once yeah. again, to be honest with you, Charlie, I just honestly think we're not going to, we'll be, we'll need to go through the, that weekend, and I think just to get this thing mixed, just to get up to the playback on the 17th. I just, so you want to you want to be mixing all the way through to the well, I'm just, to get a I just, um, well, then I'm just, I'm just being make... real with this pace, you know, of what's of what we're trying to do and, and what's all going on here. That's great. now I told I told him no <laughs> soul patch on no Rody in yeah. his Air Force one, but That's that one great. I think was already done. No, these are awesome. So how do we get them? They'll we'll be toys. Them. You'll be able to purchase them. Purchase. Yeah, or I mean, I can send them to you, but they'll be like in the tur in the toy what store. Are you talking about Jeremy, uh, come on, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Look at that one. The Mark One's awesome. It's pretty great. Very cool. That's the best monger. Yeah, isn't that awesome? It's sick. That's the best toy yet. How do you feel about that, Manny? Yeah, that's better. Than Just that. generally, I can Again. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay. I don't know. That's not really worth chasing, really. Okay. Well, it's just this one shot. Yeah. Let's, can we see just, what is okay. it about the color we'll that seems that. a little, um, yeah. um, see the blue on the left there? That, maybe we can use that as a guide to try to swing it more. Okay. Away from that. All right. Let's it's right. hard to really read it on the, on the glass. This is also, but you see how I'm swinging it away from the red and the skin? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Okay, great. That's kind of where I wanted to go. Let's try. It's a very interesting time now, and I remember this on other movies, and boy, you don't know what's going to happen. This could be anything from a flop to a, a, a moderate single, you know, where you get on base and just keep plugging along in your career to something that, you know, where, where it's beyond what people's expectations are. I honestly don't know. I'm, I'm sort of the worst person to handicap that kind of thing right now. I'm in the worst, worst seat in the house. I'm, I'm, right in the, I'm right in the thick of things. I don't know where we are. Can you click it up maybe a hair? Yeah. Right now, I'm worried about the minutia. Right now, there's still shots from ILM. We're waiting to get back. I don't know if that space battle is going to pay off. You know, I'm still in the sound mix, the DI. We're still making picture changes. That's just the nature of things. You know, this non-linear style of post-production. It used to be you would lock a movie, you do the music, and then you'd sit back and mix at this point. Well, we're still making picture changes. Ramin's still composing score cues for us, if it doesn't quite fit. We're dancing as fast as we can. And, and then I'm going to be promoting the thing all around the world. I don't mind it, though. Hey, I think if it was just up, it would be like less saturated posters. back there. Looks like a Star Wars poster. This is a bit of a fever pitch. We're getting all the shots in. We're trying to finish them up. All the work of you know two years is all paying off now. We've showed it to some people. We've shown like an unfinished version to like Paramount Foreign Distributors. They laugh. They like it. We've shown scenes at Comic-Con, WonderCon. They all like it. I've shown friends. But this is a Marvel movie. We don't test these movies. So I don't know. They don't want it getting out on the internet. It's a very secret process. So. I, I really don't know how people are going to react to this thing. I know the people close to me seem to like it. Uh, I know that there's funny scenes, that there are scenes with a lot of heart. There's a lot of truth in it. I love the performances. I love the cast. I think the suit worked out really well. I think ILM did a spectacular job. The score sounds good to me, and certainly the, the sound effects sound great. So I don't know. Okay, so this is the all ADR cut that's loaded. Send them to okay. the versions. All right, let's see what we got here. How do you think the Mark I chess piece is gonna hold up? The suit's at 48% power and falling, sir. That chess piece was never designed for sustained flight. Keep you posted. I've located this pass. Pepper. Tony! Tony, are you okay? I'm fine, listen. Oh, but Dyer, he's, he's got insane. I know, he, listen. You better get out of there. What am I looking at now? Where do you think you're going? Your services are no longer required. What a waste. That what a waste sounds. Well, all those three lines, are they complementary is the big question. Um, I don't think so. Well, you, they've got to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. assuming, assuming we could get it to sound, sound the same. Good. Your service is... Okay, because you the have... The whole thing about him pointing the gun, it, the, the, a line over pointing the gun explains why he's not smoking her, right? That's the whole thing. That's the idea. Right? Yeah. 
So, so your services are no longer required. I would push over that. I know we had it there once before. Mm -hmm. I would say what I would get what a waste out of there. Okay. And I would just try to duplicate your thing down here. Okay, where are you working? ADR work big? Yeah. Okay. So, right here. <laughs> he hates when directors point at the screen during photo ops. I do it all the time. Where do you think you're going? Your services are no longer required. I guess we're talking about moving <laughs> Right here. Sure, and getting, getting rid of what a waste. Okay. Yes. Mixed downs because that stuff is so Oh, you're you're I'll using mixed downs? Yes, we'll just write. They'll be just in the dialogue tracks too. <laughs> That's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> if a director snaps, he loses his fingers. These are the cuts. Right. <laughs> this is how they know it cut. You get the rhythm of the cut. There's just it'll just be like. Your services are no longer required. Yay! You put in is a, a pepper pots before your services are no longer required to bridge that cut. Pepper pots. Pepper pots. You could tell me that this thing barely made its money back in its theatrical release, I would believe you, or that it, it blew up and I would believe that too. I know there's a lot of big movies coming out this summer and they look good. As the head of uh, Sony Distribution told me last time around, he says there's only so many seats in the bus, you know, and, and uh, you know, you got about three or four movies get to be a hit in either a holiday season or a summer season, and you're either in it or you're not. Pepper pot. <laughs> Pepper pot. Pepper pot. The services are no longer required. Pepper pot. Come on, Jeremy, you said that was a good one. Pepper pot. That, that's that was the studio select. That was the one that came with the line, uh, Pepper Potts, I have the feeling you're trying to avoid me. So beautiful, what a waste. I know that I'm proud of it. I know that we've done everything we can. I know that we're hitting some sort of note because we're getting feedback. After Comic-Con, we showed the footage, people got on board and got excited about it. And now it's being spoken of in the same breath as like Batman and Indiana Jones. I mean, we weren't part of that conversation when we started out off. We were like an unknown quantity. It built from like a, a small little grassroots thing into something where people are anticipating it. So I know the awareness is there, which is something I didn't have on Zathura, the last film I worked on. So it feels different than that. As our first film out of the gate, I couldn't be happier. I couldn't be more proud of the, uh, of the film that we've put together, of the team that we've put together, of the cast that we've put together, and of, uh, and of John. It feels very, very good to have this kind of buzz on a character that outside of the hardcore Marvel fans, most people didn't know a year ago. Most people go, well, oh, is he the guy in the metal and the suit and with the goatee? Maybe people knew. And now the name Tony Stark is as famous as the name Iron Man. Uh, it feels exciting. It feels like people are ready to go out there and, uh, and start the summer off with, uh, with our film, which is going to deliver. first one out, people seem to be, you know, ready for the thing. Let's see if uh, that internet buzz translates to a larger buzz uh, and, and, and an anticipation with, with, the, with the general audience. But I do feel confident going in, and I get the, the suspicion that I'll be doing more of these, and, you know, it could potentially change, the, you know, the, the nature of, of my whole life and my whole career. I'm in, I'm in great company and I've never had it so good. Is it cool to be directing a movie, like it's, a comic book movie? It's awesome, man. I grew up reading this thing and now here I'm making this movie.